Welcome everyone. Um, I appreciate you all joining us today for uh, another webinar about our favorite topic, uh, which is cybersecurity. I can promise you one thing, this is something you'll hear us continue to talk about. Um, so we did a webinar earlier this year. We had Chad, who's with us today. He's our CIO here at Aldridge and Mitch Sowers, another CIO that we've got. And we, so earlier in the year, we talked about some of the discovery we were doing around cybersecurity and some of the things that we were taking to market. So wanted to do this as a follow-up to that webinar. Um, and also we, we did a survey earlier in the year um, surveying clients and vendors and some prospects about their take on cyber insurance, who had it, who didn't have it, how well they felt they were knowledgeable about it, and the results weren't good. We, we had only about 50% of the people that responded confidently could say, yes, they had coverage. The other 50% said they didn't have it or they just weren't, un or they were just unsure. <clears throat> so um, earlier in the year, I went to an industry conference and heard Reed Wellock, who's with us today, president of Fifth Wall, talk there about their services and I'll let them introduce themselves here in a bit. But I, I left the event saying, this is a no brainer. We've got to get these guys in front of our client base, in front of our partners, so they can be educated on, on this topic and what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing um, and, and what to really look out for. So with all that being said, I'll shut up so you guys can all listen to the people you really came to hear. And so Reed Wellock with Fifth Wall, West Spencer, uh, with Fifth Wall, why don't you guys just introduce yourself a little bit more about what Fifth Wall does, um, and then we'll kick it back over to Chad. Um, like I said, he is our CIO and also a CIO for some of our key clients um, to just kind of lay the groundwork work as to why we're here today, um, and then talk a little more about the insurance component. So, Reed, Wes, how about you? Sure. Thanks, Brian. Um... I'll, uh, I'll jump in and go first. My name is Reed Wallach. I'm the president of Fifth Wall. And uh, what Fifth Wall does is we are a group of cyber insurance nerds. We, um, we're the, the rarity that, that loves to talk about cyber insurance. And uh, we have a lot of experience. So we are a wholesaler, which means we access the global marketplace of different carriers and programs out there that provide cyber insurance. And we work with thousands of agents um, and agencies across the country. And uh, our history is is mostly that, but then most recently with the, the, the nuances of, of what insurance is requiring, we had to get a technical bet and we had to bring in some really smart people. So that's what uh, brought Wes Spencer to the table, um, who has a long resume of, of from the security world um, and has helped us develop more of our programs uh, specific, specifically around security and in risk management. So Wes, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, so you said you're a company full of insurance nerds. I'm, I guess I'm the odd man out because I'm a yeah. cybersecurity nerd and uh, been working with um, Aldridge and um, other IT providers just to help in, in cybersecurity. And it's something I'm passionate about because threats have come down market, right? We know this, like it's not just Bank of America uh, that gets attacked or Uber, it's small businesses and midsize every single day. And so I'm here to help with that and really pumped about it and glad that uh, Aldridge and team have opened up uh, a webinar because this is going to be a great, great event. Yeah, no, I appreciate you guys joining us today. And, and just to throw it out there, this isn't a service that we Aldridge make money off of from Fifth Wall. There's no financial incentive for us to do that. We simply want to do this to get the right information out to our clients and partners to, to make sure they're making smart decisions in their business. Chad, you want to inter introduce yourself, what you do here, and kind of take us into the next section of the webinar? Sure. Uh, I'm Chad. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Aldridge, which is a lot of words to basically say, I make sure that the technology that we're bringing to the table for our clients is actually helping them accomplish what they want to do for their business. And especially over the last several years, that conversation has to have security baked into it at every step of the way. And so I'm just really excited to be able to present the information here, but also then key off fifth wall so that they can have a very informative presentation to help educate us all about cyber security insurance and what it looks like today. You know, with that, why don't we go ahead and get rolling here? Uh, because I don't want to hold things up because I know fifth wall has a ton of content and good conversation too. Yeah, so, and one, one other thing to add, sorry. Um, oh, please. We will, have a, we will have a question and answer section at the end. But if you think of things along the way, don't hesitate, pop those into uh, the questions section 
and I'll either filter those in as we go or ask them at the end. So thank you. A little bit of housekeeping. That all works. So let's start with a quick recap of what is cybersecurity. I mean, we're talking about insurance. What are we trying to insure against? Cybersecurity is really just about taking reasonable steps to secure your organization, your data, your property, your clients, your vendors, your financials, your operating reputation from bad actors who want to exploit you. They're probably looking for financial gain through fraud or, or theft or other practices, or they could be looking to even disrupt your operation. And bad actors could be one person inside or outside your organization, or they could even be today state-funded groups that are looking for footholds to disrupt commerce. I mean, you've seen and read about uh, the most common types of attacks that are out there today, um, social engineering, ransomware, vulnerabilities, phishing, credential theft. The ongoing challenge is that all of these cyber attacks are on the rise. Uh, you've probably seen at least one phishing email yourself, something that asks you to click a link, provide your credentials, check on the status of that unexpected FedEx package or credit memo. Your employees certainly have seen at least one phishing email, and I hope that you're confident that they aren't clicking on those. And in the news, we hear about zero-day attacks or vulnerabilities discovered in software or services that we all use. Is security is and always will be a moving target, and it's important that we have to keep up with current best practices to help defend your organization. We do know that the bad actors are becoming more sophisticated. And just last month, for example, um, Microsoft published an information update on an ongoing set of phishing attacks against over 10,000 organizations since September of last year, where the bad actors are actually mimicking the software, the Microsoft service login page, even to the point of if you put your company logo on it, they lift the logo and drop it onto their phishing site so that in reality, your users are entering their credentials on the bad actor site and capturing it in the middle. And the goal there is to coach your users to log onto their page instead of Microsoft's such that your user completes the multi-factor authentication, thinking they're logging into a Microsoft site, but then the bad actors take that authenticated session that's just been handed to them by a user who didn't realize what was going on, and then they go on to compromise that user's business email and start communicating as them with your customers and your vendors. And when we talk about cybersecurity defense with our clients, we're often talking about education and protection through good design and cybersecurity tool choices and defending against attacks. And we often use the, the NIST cybersecurity framework, identify, protect, uh, detect, respond, and recover. But we start with an understanding of what's in your environment to protect. Where's the data live? Where's the critical or sensitive data live? What business operations do you need to be able to have to conduct business every day or every week or every month? Cybersecurity education and tools start to add a layer of protection on top of that and the ability to detect if an inside or an outside bad actor is attempting to exploit your organization. And at Aldridge, we also then have the technical response and recovery services. And I do say the technical response. We isolate the threat, we identify the damage, we recover affected systems from backups, we put recovery planning in place early in the process, and we are able to do a bit of a technical after action to say, okay, we saw this, we saw this, and saw this, let's reconstruct the timeline, and let's reevaluate the security, let's harden further against that. It takes time and it takes resources and it takes effort on all parts. Over and above maintaining that healthy current IT environment, the supported, the patched software, the good design choices for networking, good design choices for applications, good design choices for information management, we're using a layered approach to security because we know there isn't one solution that addresses all the risks. Fortunately, the cybersecurity industry continues to evolve, and many of the protections that were limited to large enterprises just a few years ago have really increased in efficiency and grown in scale, and they've come down in the implementation and operating costs, such that they're available to most every business today. That's a good thing. I mean, the tools available to run through the whole stack, the identify, protect, or detect, respond, recover, all of those continue to evolve, but that also means that the bar is raising. People expect, cybersecurity insurers expect that you are following along with these trends. And as these tools become available, they become a, you must be this called a ride type conversation to make sure that you're doing what's best for your company for security. That phishing attack example that I mentioned earlier uh, that Microsoft sent the email out, it's not a new technique. 
but it's just better executed than previous examples. The bad guys build on top of their prior successes and refine, just like we try to refine the protection tools. And that's why it's important to use that layered security approach. Each layer, including the ongoing security awareness training your users receive, has an opportunity to inspect and detect and stop each particular threat before you experience a loss. But if a threat does make it through your technology, your processes and your people, the immediate job becomes response and recovery. And again, when we talk about response and recovery, speaking from an IT perspective, we often focus in on the technical and the operational responses. But as you've seen in the news, there's also a necessary public response for most major cybersecurity incidents. It can impact your customers, it can impact your vendors, it can impact your reputation. The technical response is about stopping the damage and repairing it and restoring access to information and systems so you can resume business. Then we start moving into the operational response response. Management level process, we know what must be done when we have to be able to conduct business so the technical recovery can be prioritized and most, help, or most helpful. Sometimes you make choices during a technical recovery based on your operational response to say, we need to prioritize getting this back up and running first. Great. That's all part of the response. The public response then considers the impact outside your organization. Did the bad actor leverage those compromised email credentials? Or were they corresponding as you with your customers? Did they intercept financial information? Were they talking to your vendors? Did they give your vendors new payment information or your, new or your customers new payment information? Did they gain enough access to reach protected personal information that might be stored in your systems, whether they're on-premise or in the cloud? Do you even have a regulatory or a compliance or a reporting requirement to consider? Some events pass the threshold of you've now got to actually report to someone because of the industry that you're in that this happened. Response leads into recovery. And in some instances, recovery can have a long tail from extended data recovery efforts. I mean, we got you back online, but we still need to restore some of that data from a year ago that maybe was suspect during the event. Or Maybe even data has to be reconstructed, or maybe you have to manage and rebuild customer and vendor trust and more. We can use security awareness training and best practices and cybersecurity tools to help protect from threats up front and detect and isolate many of those types of threats quickly before they cause damage. But there's unfortunately not a big switch. Anyone can just flip that says, that's it, we're secure, done. Uh, operations involve risk, and some events can have larger unexpected impacts than others. We're talking about insurance today because we recognize that it's not possible to prevent all risk and in the event of a significant response or recovery need it's important to have an understanding of what businesses like yours could go through and how they prepare to minimize the damage you know with that i'm going to turn things over to reed and wes with fifth wall because really this is about insurance so let's talk about what response and recovery preparedness looks like hang on just a moment i'll switch presenter over to you reed Thank you, Chad. All right, let me go ahead and bring up my screen here. All right, so looks like we got the like wrong I said, screen. I'm not the tech guy. <laughs> yeah, well, this is uh, this is what we practice for, right? <laughs> All right. It's amazing. On it goes perfectly folks. in the practice session, and then yeah. Right. Well, we're going to try this again with Gusto. One second. All right. Good response and recovery. <laughs> That's right. And while you're doing that, uh, one thing I just want to jump in and say, Chad, I think is so good is I love that you guys are leading with that message of we're doing all the right things to harden ourselves. But there comes a time when a breach happens. And I've worked with so many companies, big and small, that have gone through a breach. It's not a question of if something is going to happen. It's a question of when. And uh, that's what you want from a partner. I love that you guys at Aldridge are like, we're positioned to do the right things to stop it, but it's going to happen. And here's what we're going to yeah. do when it happens. I love it. So with that, um, now that the insurance guy got the technical piece to work, right? Um, quick disclaimer. So we're going to go through uh, hopefully some good content here. And, and, and the idea uh, is for education first. That's what we're trying to drive, because this is a topic that I think uh, it's been around for some time. It's just gotten a lot more popular for unfortunately bad reasons. So uh, we're going to talk about some examples. I do want to cover a little bit of policy stuff, so I'm hopefully not going to bore too many folks here. But uh, we are going to be doing this as, you know, these are examples. Uh, we're going to do summaries. So I'm not pointing to anything specifically. I'm not going to mention 
carriers by name, even though some are doing things. There's one carrier in particular we are going to point out later in the presentation, just because it is noteworthy um, and it's relevant to, to what we're going to describe in the process. Um, so with that, I always like to set the tone with getting folks just on the same page that this happens in different ways. So what Chad alluded to is, and, and what Wes just highlighted is, this is unfortunately a win, um, but how? That's that's often a question. And that's what comes into the complexities of, well then what do we need to stop it? Because we can think of all these different ways these can unfold. So when we think about data and we think about what bad actors are after, the tactics they often are taking are typically just through people, right? And a lot of these examples you're gonna see are just through basic manipulation. And that's a scary thing because humans are um, easily manipulated at, at this day and age with, with the different varying degrees of, of maturity around security, myself included, who can't get a PowerPoint to come up in a webinar. Um, so an employee transmitted a virus to customers and suppliers and the company was sued for failing to contain the virus. Losses totaled more than three million. The reason I highlight this example is that often right now we live in a litigious society and sometimes you don't do anything per se wrong, but you get caught in the crosshairs. Guess what? If a lawyer finds out that their client doesn't necessarily have to pay the damages because it's someone else's fault, it's happening and it's happening a lot. All right, so something to think about when you think about your access that you could provide to somebody else. Um, an email that appeared to be from a long-standing vendor relationship directed a company to update banking information. The company had paid over 200K to the fraudster. We're seeing a lot of this. We're seeing a lot of this. Um, and it's really basic tactics and folks are out money like that. By the time they click send or they hit submit, um, they're you know they're getting that hit feeling in their stomach going, oh no, what did I just do? Um, and a hacker gained access to the email account of an employee of a small accounting firm. The hacker used the email to address the compromise sub, uh, to compromise several of the firm's client organizations. I bring this up because often folks, we look at our exposure and we think about what do I have, but you got to look at what you could also provide access to. And guess what? Those are your partners. Those are your clients. Um, that is really a large part of your exposure, and we want to cover that today. Um, and I throw these out as just random scenarios, but it, you're going to see the theme. The theme's around access. The theme, theme, theme is around, okay, if this happens, what are the consequences? And it really is an exercise. It's a tabletop exercise every business should be going through today. Wes, you, you have a history with this, given your background, right? And I'm sure you've done this with a lot of business owners, done tabletops, walking them through different scenarios. And I'm sure some of these might might hit close to home for you. Uh, every single one sits close to home. I've worked with organizations, Reed, that have gone through every one of these scenarios. And, uh, you know, they're they're damaging. They are, um, I've seen, I've literally seen businesses in tears over these kinds of yeah. things. Um, I talked to one uh, fairly recently out of New York City, and uh, he said, when this happened, my business came crashing down and my life with it. He said, I don't have a 401k. My small business is my inheritance. Yeah. It's my future. It's what I have positioned for my kids. And he said, when this hit, and my client, he said, I'm literally getting 60 phone calls an hour from clients, angry, swearing at me, every manner of, you know, vile things because they're frustrated that we got hit with ransomware. And he's like, I was like, what'd you do? And he said, oh, honestly, first thing I did, I go in my office, I close the door and I cry. He's like, I kid you not, I cry. He's like, then I pick myself up and I say, we can get through this. We're going to make it through month of re really hard, really 80 hour weeks. He did recover. Unfortunately, um, he had insurance, and we'll talk about like how that augments and comes alongside. But you know, just share that story, not to not to put a fear in anybody, but to say uh, we do face an adversary that goes after small and mid-sized businesses because they're not positioned like a Bank of America is. They don't have all those things, and so it's easier for them to go after a slew of smaller businesses that don't have things in place. And so again, we talk about not a question of if, a question of when. And so part of the when is, well, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna recover? What am I gonna do right. to augment? And how do I even handle from the risk perspective? I can't just write away risk, I have to accept it, but I can transfer some of this risk over to insurance. And so these are the things, these scenarios read are so good because it kind of gives a lot of different areas of where this happens. I think the final thing I'll just say on this piece is, you know, if I'm a bad guy, what I'm thinking for you as a small business is how can I force you to pay me? Because most of these threat actors that we have in these scenarios here yeah. are like, I wanna push enough pain to you to force you to pay me to get out of it. Yeah, it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing they do, but that's what they're going after. So if they push ransomware on you and they make it to where everything's encrypted, you have to pay to get it back. 
if they trick you into sending an invoice to the wrong place and yep. wire fraud occurs, they're doing that to, to take money from you. So like, how can I force you into paying? And so that's why this has become so important is because most of these threat actors are operating out of countries like Russia, out of uh, uh, Vietnam, places that we don't, Syria, places that we don't have extradition authority and their countries just look the other way as long as they're taking money from, from the West, don't care. And so this yeah. is the threat that we face. It's become so prevalent since 2018 and on. I've seen it grow from small things and growing and growing and growing. Now it's this colossal issue that all businesses must face. We and see I, that on the claim side. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to chime in to talk about how real this is. We, we had a company that we were talking to not too long ago, I think in the past 30 days or so, um, about doing a project with us. And the person on our end had been corresponding with them and client sign, signs the quote to approve the project. We send the invoice for the hardware and about 30 days goes by, no, no payment received. And so our accounting team calls him up and says, hey, we, we haven't received payment, it's, it's overdue. And he's like, what do you mean you didn't receive payment? I wired it to you like two weeks ago. And come to find out his email had been compromised. He didn't have multi-factor authentication set up and they had been riding along, waiting for the perfect time and essentially took our, our invoice, changed the routing information and he updated that and sent the money off to the wrong place. And so we, we see that kind of stuff happen more often than I would like to. And to Chad's point earlier about having that layered approach, certainly need to have those things. Had we had multi, had he had multi-factor on, it would have probably flagged it, but it still may not have. There's other tactics that you right. guys certainly know of that they could have gotten through that. And so just, just putting that out there because it's something that just happened not too long ago and it was a painful situation to be in. Um, and speaking so, of the, the layered yeah. approach to that, a lot of companies also recognize that particular threat, that change of routing information by someone in the middle as one of the most common tactics now. And so most companies have adopted, we call a predetermined number to verify any change in routing information. We don't mm -hmm. use the phone number that's in the email. We call the company number that we already know and say, hey, we received new routing information. We're calling to verify. And then usually it takes a second person in the firm to then approve it. Say, yes, it has actually happened. It yep. may sound like a burdensome thing to have to do. Like, oh, I got to call every, but changes don't happen all that much. And if that saves you wow. six figures, worth it every time. Oh, yeah. Now, for those of you that wanted to jump on a webinar Tuesday afternoon and hear a warm and fuzzy thing, unfortunately, this is not going to be warm and fuzzy conversation. But just to move us through, you know, I, I do want to say there's light at the end of the tunnel just in terms of preparation and, and making sure that we are. We're addressing the facts. This is reality. This is an unfortunate reality, but we are going to be looking at what does this solution look like? Well, how do we relieve this pain? And one thing, I think we've already highlighted it, but it really is true. I mean, we're seeing, we saw this on the insurance side, and I know, Chad, Brian, West, you guys are probably going, well, duh, this, you know, we knew this years ago. But on the insurance side, what we see, and we're looking at data, we're looking at the past, um, this is not a technology problem. The technologies exist today to mitigate a lot of this. It's not going to be airtight but it can really reduce the risk. We're seeing a lot of it on the human element because it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to manipulate someone, to prey on someone, to, to West, your point, to create a false sense of urgency, right? Uh, to get someone to do something. And um, we're human, so we are gonna make mistakes. So I wanna circle the wagon real quick on how we got here, okay? First of all, we're, we're talking about insurance. We're talking about insurance with technology. This is great, but this has not always been relevant. So how did we get to this relevant conversation? So cyber insurance has existed for a while. Actually, it was created back in uh, the late 90s. It was mainly out of the failure of somebody saying, look, I don't want to get sued because of what my technology may or may not do, right? That's how it started. And, and then it kind of grew out of, well, I don't want someone to sue me because they use my technology, they, they embed it with a virus and they want to stay, they sue me later on. And then all of a sudden it kind of got to more first party coverages where, oh, wait a minute, I could be you know, fined or penalized and now I need to be basically, I'm responsible and liable for anything that my business does when it comes to the information that I am a steward of. And guess what? Now I'm liable to other third parties. So we saw in the market that folks really started paying attention to this around 2015 and, and, and making specific investments on what we'll call, I'll, I'll address this later, but standalone policies. Um, and, but it was a slow churn. 
And that really was just kind of a, you know, not many folks were touching the stove to know it was hot yet, right? They didn't, they didn't actually experience a breach, but they were hearing it a lot. They were hearing, oh, I heard, did you see this in the news? Did you hear about so-and-so? And then it really started to ramp up. Ransomware came into play. And then we started seeing industries that weren't really going to, we didn't think would be targeted. They became main targets. I mean, we saw education start to get hit. We saw manufacturing. Um, and so where we are today is carriers weren't prepared. That's the honest truth. They weren't prepared for that huge shift so quickly. This is not a fast moving industry. And because of that, all of a sudden to get cyber insurance, the game changed. It wasn't just that you needed to have a few pieces of information to qualify. It's like, wait a minute, we actually need to make sure you have what we know is important to have to lower your risk. And those, that's, I mean, for Brian and Chad, I know you guys are nodding because these are the components you already provide today, but insurance is finally catching up, right? So now, now we're in Congress. We're actually saying the same things. And I mentioned the standalone policy. Um, for those of you that, that did the survey that, that Brian mentioned, and 50% of you said we have cyber insurance. Now, 50% of you said we don't think we do, and that's a scary thing, and we can address that later. But for those of you that said you did, there's a really important exercise because there's there's not the same kind of cyber insurance out there, right? Um, and and much to probably, you know, Wes wanted to stay away from insurance as much as possible, but I keep pulling him in and I keep trying to teach him more and more about this stuff. So I know he could probably talk about this too, but we're seeing a lot of these endorsements that are on our lines of coverage. And to be to be frank with you, it's not the agent's fault that may have sold that to you to say, hey, this is good coverage when actually it's not. They may actually not know. Uh, again, this is an evolving thing that's happening. Um, but re the reality is, is, is that if your cyber coverage is attached to another line of coverage, so if you have like a general liability policy and they say, oh yeah, you've got cyber included, uh, you should really take a closer look at that or have somebody take a closer look at that because the reality is it's not even gonna come close. You know, Whenever that, that crucial time arises and you're like, well, thank goodness I have cyber, it's gonna get about to you know a quarter of a mile and, and then stop. Right. It doesn't have a large limit where standalone policy is really meant to soup to nuts, bring you back to where you once were. And and Reed, it's not like the agent like intentionally is misleading anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, we know this because we work with thousands of agents. Oftentimes they, you talk about fire, life, casualty, all these things well in their wheelhouse. But then you get into this cyber piece and they just don't often have the experience. They don't come at it from like the technical components they don't understand how damaging it can be and so sometimes the agent might just think well it's it's a writer on your your liability like everything's fine like hundred thousand that sure. should be plenty for an attack i can't see anything being more than that and then come to find out and and you don't know because you don't ask the questions because you know most people like me yeah. like i don't really understand all this mumbo jumbo and in insurance and so you think it's fine until you have to pay a ransom of two hundred thousand dollars you know and then you have all the other things that you see on the screen right here that start compounding that and and we see this happen unfortunately and so this is where Absolutely. it becomes a real mess and the client says i had no idea i had no idea both that it could be this expensive and that i i was not positioned to be able to handle that have a, you have got a, go ahead. The, a lot of numbers get thrown out about average size of the ransom that's being asked of um, I've seen numbers literally all over the board. What what are you guys seeing these days? I know Chad may be able to pipe in for some horror stories he's seen on his side too, but what, what are those numbers yeah. like? So I, can, I can actually give you definitive numbers. Um, so there's a company called Coveware, C-O-V-E-W-A-R-E, Coveware. They actually pay a vast majority of all the ransoms. They're like a they're sort of a regulated company that has the ability through Treasury and, and all this to actually pay ransoms out to threat actors. It's a very controlled process. And so they have really good insights into, into all of this. And what they're seeing is just the cost of a ransomware attack alone. We you take the big highs at multi-millions, you take the lows at 100 k It averages out from last quarter um, to be about $211,529. There's your number. But that's just the cost of the ransomware but that's staggering to think just about a quarter million dollars is an average ransomware payment 
And part of the reason for that, Brian, is these these bad guys are insidious. They don't just like guess. They don't put their finger in the wind and say, well, we, we attacked you. Now all your machines are ransomed. We'll just throw a number out. No, they actually look into your accounts payable. They look at your revenue. They look at how many clients you have. They steal those clients. And we say, we know this is how much money you made last year. So we know you can pay this. And if you don't, we're going to go out to all these clients and tell them we hit you with ransomware. Like they do everything they can to wrench it from you. They delete your backups if they can. They're doing everything they can do because but honestly, they're horrible people. Um, and this is what they're forcing you into. So they, yeah, there it is, just 211K, just as the average cost, not compounding all the other problems that you see that add to the cost that you see on the screen here. And actually, I'm gonna use that as a segue because what we look at and what we wanna look at too is that's just for the ransomware payment, right Wes? That's what you said? That's right. Yeah, so you have to pay that, but eventually you have to get there. And guess what? You also have to get out of that. Yeah. All the costs associated with that. And that's often something that's not that's not considered. And in my role, if I'm sitting down with a client and they're asking me, well, why do I need cyber insurance? Well, that's one piece of it, but there's all these other pieces of, of relevancy of just from getting from A to B to C is not an easy process. And in this slide, I, I like um, mainly because I made it, but I like it because it does paint a picture of there's there's a lot of things that can happen. Okay. There's a lot of things that can happen post breach. Um, but in the insurance side, there's some consistency as far as here's how we typically move in the incident response world, how we're typically moving that we're triaging that client. And it's going to involve legal because if third party information was exposed, right, you, you want to establish privilege and, and, and we need to be aware. What are you beholden to? What compliance regulations, state, federal, whatever it may be, depending on your industry. Um, and also, we're going to need to get some details on how this happened, what happened, to what degree, right? And in the, the process of forensics, doing that due diligence, guess what? It is not cheap. And this is just to get information so we know how to move forward and we know how to move forward appropriately. Um, beyond that, it starts to spider web out because then we have, once we get the information and we, we know which steps we need to take, um, you may be having to notify folks that were exposed. Um, you may be having to utilize public relations, which optics are important, especially when you get breached. You don't want to be viewed as less secure. Um, and there's other third parties that you're going to start to see, oh, wow, I need to bring this service in. I need to bring this service in. And that's what insurance is really trying to do. And I'm not going to go through this full list, right? I know we're on an insurance webinar. I don't want to bore people further than I need to. But there's a, there's important elements here that if, and I'm gonna I'm gonna really make sure everyone's listening to this. You need to know this. You need to sit down and go through with someone what a policy actually covers. And even at a base level of understanding, go through it because what it does is it'll start to show you, oh, these are the different nuances. These are the different ways I could be impacted by a breach. Insurance is kind of telling me the, the story just in reverse, right? So it can really be insightful for you to walk through this and it's a quick exercise to see, oh, I didn't really think about this scenario. I didn't think about the fact that, oh, uh, insurance covers business interruption, right? So while I'm going through and dealing with all of this, I'm losing revenue because I can't run my business. Insurance doesn't cover that. Oh, I have reputational damage because I'm viewed as less secure and I actually lost clients because of this. They left, guess what? Insurance can cover that. You can, that's lost revenue. Uh, paying the ransom paying for for funds that you've accidentally sent to the wrong party these are all things that a good policy is going to cover and it's actually meant to make you whole so i'll get off my insurance soapbox but i want to make sure that that is noted is it's a really important exercise and we understand not just what's there but what are the limits that it's covering and that can actually in turn influence a lot of your risk management so what what's the thought process a company should go through when they're trying to understand what what kind of coverage should I get? Is a million dollars enough? Is a million dollars the minimum that you recommend? Where, where, how do you work through that with them? That is a great question, Brian. What is, and I'm going to speak from the industry in general. So the industry in general is looking at this, they're looking at the data, and they're looking at the average cost of claims. And the recommended limit for any business, you could be a two-person bakery, right? And you ask me, I'm going to recommend a full $1 million limit policy. The reason is there's just too many scenarios on the, how this can unfold where you get into six figures. And once you get there, there's just too many examples, again, to showcase, you know, well, could I get a half a million? Maybe, but there's too many instances this could be an $800,000 event. So on average, 
we're seeing, you know, 1 million is the base. That's the table stakes. Now, the question then becomes, well, when do I need to talk to my agent or talk to someone about a higher limit? We start looking at then your business around revenue that you have, the size that you are, right? We want to look at your operations so we can run a quick exercise at the average. Wes, what's the average downtime for, for about, ransomware? About 16 right days for ransomware. 16 days. Okay. And, and you want to run through an exercise. Okay. Lost revenue associated with that downtime. What does that look like? Okay. Now that's one element, but it's a big element. If all of a sudden you go through that, you're like, wow, I'm full a million. I'm past a million already. Guess what? We got to be looking at a two, a two million. So Brian, to answer your question, millions, the, the table stakes. And then it's really important. You actually go through an exercise to talk to somebody that understands the different uh, parts and pieces of this to determine is a higher limit necessary. Thanks. No problem. And, and maybe read one final thing on that question. too is yeah. sometimes you'll have you'll, you're in an industry and you're forced to have more. You might have a critical supplier that you're a client of, and they're forcing you to have a certain amount. We see this with I think car dealerships a lot. Is that right, Reed? Where they're yeah. starting to be forced into certain minimums. The Safeguard Act came out, and it's um, you, you're going to see so two things are happening, and they've already they're already happened, but it's happening more. Is you're seeing the state, so New York and California are are, are pretty. Um, they're heavy hitters with this. Like right now in New York, we see with, if you're in professional services, right? And your revenue is over a million. Um, guess what? You're, you are required by state to carry a million dollar cyber liability policy. California has done the same. And then we're also starting to see the industries themselves are driving a lot of requirements to carry cyber. And next level is you're going to see that um, business to business, B2B, you're going to start to see in service level agreements, um, and in and, and MSAs, you're going to start to see that folks are requiring that if we're going to do business with each other, right, I really need to see that you have enough protection here. Because guess what? For each partner that I, I take on, I'm now further exposing myself. You are now one more instance of someone I'm working with that could compromise my business, right? So we're seeing this more and more, um, which hopefully for anyone on the call, that's a big alarm bell. Like that's, that's telling you this is real and it's not, this isn't just a, a luxury item anymore. It's becoming critical. So if it's all right, I'd like to shift a little bit. Um, and, and I, I want to make sure this, uh, Brian mentioned this earlier, but if you do have any questions, do throw them in the chat. I'm someone that if I don't ask the question right then and there, sometimes I just forget it and we get to the end and I'm going, oh, what was it? Throw it in there just so you don't forget even. This is a placeholder. And if it's insurance question, great. Because if you haven't noticed, I love talking about insurance. All right. Mm -hmm. How do we get insurance right now? It used to be back in the day, right? If this was 2017 and you said, Reed, I'd like to get a cyber policy. You're like, great. What's your revenue? How many employees do you have? And do you have a website? You give that information to me and you go, okay, what else do you need? I go, that's it. Here's your policy. It's crazy, right? Um, and actually that's kind of what got us into trouble, to be honest. You've got a lot of exposure there for the carriers who didn't do a lot of checks and balances. They didn't really understand the risk they were taking on, but this was a new product and they wanted to sell new products. That's, but so it's their fault. So you fast forward to today. Now lessons have been learned. Carriers have learned, oh wait, we need to actually make sure these are good risks. Now, what does that mean? And, and so on this slide, you're seeing eligibility core controls, all right? And, and what that's really saying is from, from my world, these are table stakes if you're going to be looking to get an insurance policy. And guess what? That should tell you something. That's saying that the, the insurance industry is looking at the data and they're saying, well, if we're going to keep writing this business, we need to make sure folks are at least at a certain base level of, of proper risk management, okay? And... Um, you know, I, I think I can talk about this from an insurance perspective, but I don't know if Brian, Chad, Wes, if, you, if any of you want to actually hit each one of these just sure. to kind of yeah, to quickly the just say yeah. which each, each one of these are. Yeah, uh, number one is multi-factor authentication because we all know that people are not secure with their passwords by themselves. And multi-factor authentication, you've all seen it when you log into your banking. Uh, after you go to log into the website, it sends you a message on your phone or it has you click something on your phone or some other way to prove you really are who you say you are. Because we know passwords get compromised and multi-factor is the first level of protection against that. It's not a panacea, it doesn't block everything. I can storm your phone at 2 a.m. 100 times until you finally just answer approve out of frustration. 
So it's still possible to bypass security with people. That leads into the security awareness training and testing, which really you want to, you don't need to produce your own content for this. You want to subscribe to curated content that's being constantly updated by groups that specialize in cybersecurity and making it real in 15 or 30 minute chunks or one hour chunks for your employees such that they're on an annual or a quarterly program where they're keeping current about what the threat landscape looks like. But even beyond that, most of these services then send phishing messages to your own people and then report back to you how many people clicked. How many people provided their credentials? How many people provided financial information? How far did it go? And it gives you a barometer that you can then have positive conversations with your team saying, hey, good job, guys. I really appreciate you watching out for the firm and being conscientious about this. Or you can have the other conversation saying, well, we're, we're gonna ramp this up here because there's a gap in what we're prepared to protect ourselves against. You start moving to segregated backups and Reed mentioned this earlier, Wes mentioned it earlier about the bad guys try to delete the backups prior to compromising the system. And so you know, there's this big term about air-gapped backups, which basically means I can't delete the backup from the environment that it's protecting. If I compromise the environment that's protected, the backup is in a completely separate system. And we do that through cloud separation, through additional controls, through deletion prevention and so forth, where we just wanna make sure that there's always a recovery mechanism so that we can minimize that 16 day average downtime in a ransomware event. We wanna get that down closer to two to five if we can. Part of that is segregated backups so the bad guys couldn't get those. The patching and vulnerability scanning is the reality of that we're all using software and services that we didn't write. We're not the guys that actually wrote the software. We're depending on the big guys to go write the yeah. software. And sometimes people make mistakes or they have an oversight. Well, the bad guys are constantly hammering this stuff, looking for the weak spots to say, okay, if I can't bypass the people, can I bypass the technology? Or can I make the technology do something such that it makes the person then do what I want them to do? And an important part of that in a managed environment is making sure that all those software updates that are getting released are getting deployed, especially for the operating systems and the critical cloud services that you've got. And the last bit on here is the next gen antivirus. It used to be back in 2015, 2016, everybody would install Symantec or McAfee and great, I'm protected, I'm secure, good to go. And the reality is the bad guys can evolve using toolkits. I can slap down a credit card, pay a hundred bucks and generate a new bit of ransomware from any one of several websites that are set up specifically for that purpose. So. These older antivirus engines were watching for certain programs that they knew. The new antivirus engines that we all use today watch for patterns of behavior. And then you go a step further into endpoint detection and response, or even what we're working with with most of our clients, managed detection and response, MDR, where you've got agents running inside your environment, software agents that are watching the programs, watching the file activity, watching the network activity. And if something looks weird, in an EDR environment, the engine itself can say, that looks weird, I'm stopping it. And then somebody has to pause and investigate. In an MDR scenario, there's actually a security operations center 24 seven that's monitoring what the EDR is seeing. And the MDR, the SOC team then comes in and will actually adjust the MDR on the fly. Uh, we even had an event just yesterday in one of our client organizations that blocked a ransomware threat before any damage occurred. There was no business interruption. That organization is running MDR. One foothold got in from a phishing issue or whatever got that foothold into the infrastructure environment. The next gen antivirus, the EDR detected it, the SOC responded to it, killed it, rolled it back, and then notified after the fact this event happened. You probably didn't notice anything. And one thing I want to come back to on this is this, Reed, you said earlier, I love the term, you must be this tall to ride. <laughs> you know, every kid tries to get on the amusement park ride. They don't hit that green line and they walk away sad. These are the minimum requirements. These are not optional. These are not good to have. These are not like, hey, you should think about budgeting for this the next year. These are minimum. These are minimums. Um, Reed, you know this. Often I jump on with clients um, with the, the agent and the client is wondering why they got denied ransomware coverage. And every single time, let me pull up the application. It's always one of these five that's not in place. And so I have to yep. kind of do the whole, hey, don't shoot the messenger. I'm not the one that made the decision, but this is why you got denied and you got to correct this. And I remember being on with one, the CEO joined along with their CIO and the, the you know, I just had to tell him, hey, you're, you, you're, this is why you got denied. And the CEO said, we will do everything. He goes, this is mission critical. This is, we will focus on this. We'll get addressed. He goes, by the way, can we get like a 30 day extension? I'm like, 
no, it doesn't work that way. You literally have 30 days of like risk here. He's like, okay, thought you'd say that. We're going to, this is mission critical. Yeah. So there, there you have it. Yeah. And, and, and guess what, folks? Insurance is, is a for profit. Okay. So they, they want, and I can say this because, you know, we're not an insurance company, but representing them, um, they want to write policies, right? But they want to write policies for good risks. All right. So it's not that they're, you know, going out and wanting folks to make unnecessary investments. They've got the data to support. You know, this is a actuarial world. You know, they've 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 honed the science to say, this is what this is what our data is telling us to to really get a table state for good risk. So um, and this is a really good conversation too, right? Insurance and and these controls, now they're going hand in hand today. I mean, we can go to pick a random carrier. And that application is going to look very similar in terms of what they are actually looking at to determine whether or not they want to entertain you as a risk. A year and a half ago, that wasn't the case. Okay, so there is an evolution to this. And guess what? You need to be making sure you're staying in tune with that because we may be doing this webinar in six months, nine months, 12 months, and this list may be getting longer. And it's not because it's just we like to make longer lists, but you know, you got multiple industries that are really starting to pay attention to this. Yeah, I think that's a good point is, yeah, you, you've got to be this tall to ride today, but you're going to have to be taller next year. And we got, we can't wait till we get to the last minute to do your policy applications and that type of thing. Because there, to, to Wes's point, if we can be ahead of that, we know that those requirements are there, then we can make sure that we get those in place before the upcoming renewal. We're not waiting till the very last minute. And if that's the case, then we have to answer the questions correctly, because I think you're about to tell us a story of what happens if you don't. Um, I am, but, but we need but we need some time to to make sure we've got those proper things in place and we're answering. And if you think about things like security awareness training, you can't just flip the switch and be yep everybody's trained. That's a three to six month process to really get people yeah. trained up and to be confident that it's having an effect. And that's that's what I mean. We're going to talk about at the very end. That I, I don't want to make sure we move because I, I'm hoping folks have questions towards the end here. I want to make sure there's enough time. Um, but that's one of the key takeaways we want to make sure that folks get oriented around is okay okay we get it now now what does that mean what's the timing what is the process what's the cadence of this and there it does matter because it, it is not the flick of a switch so quick scary story if we haven't filled your head with enough today is this was a little bit of a uh now it's not the first time this has happened but it was a big deal because travelers you know for for a large carrier like travelers to rescind a contract for them to void coverage is a pretty big deal because guess what everyone's going to be talking about it like we are today and the nature of this was was pretty simple is that an insured a client indicated they had a certain control in place guess what they got breached when they got breached everything comes to light because now you the carrier has the ability to look under the hood do forensics and go well wait a minute you said that you had this in place but in reality you didn't and in the t's and c's in the contract sorry you know that us providing you coverage was was relying on the fact that you were telling us the truth so this isn't a story about hey make sure you know we all hopefully we all know to be honest and truthful but it's getting really serious we're getting to the point carriers are really cracking down and as a business owner you want to make sure you're privy to this right um and you want to be part of this process right you don't want to be passive on it you you want to be a participant um and you need to be working with those who are managing your security and work closely with them um, when, when this is going through a process. It's a yearly process going through a renewal application or applying for, for cyber for the first time, but it really is an important one because it, it can tell you a lot. So read three takeaways already in this webinar. One is you got to know what's in your policy. So you need to have that conversation. Yeah. Two is you got to know what those minimum requirements are, which we screenshot, you screenshot them. There they are. Talk to Aldridge about them. And yeah. three, you got to know if you have them in place and operating. Like So so if you haven't talked to Aldridge yet and you're using um, their, their IT services and their cybersecurity services, you got to say, hey, one step we need to do is can we take a look at what the policy says we're doing and what we're actually doing? I want to make sure it lines up because you, you're right. This is the way of the world. So it's another big takeaway for those that are on the call today is open up that conversation as soon as possible with Aldridge and make sure you guys have the right things in place that have you know, you've subscribed to on your on your application. Yep. Yeah, and and we can go through and, and for time's sake, we can kind of hit some of these key takeaways that I know we wanted to lay out. And then I want to make sure again, if, if there are questions, we can address those. But um, 
you really need to be planning for this, right? And this is a plan that involves two parties, really. Well, three, your organization, those that are the advisor on your IT side that are managing your security, and then an agent to actually walk through the policy and, and we're, we're gonna match them up together. Um, and insurance is a key component of this. And as Wes mentioned, you want to make sure you're working with someone that can actually walk you through to understand what this is and what this is not. And the fifth wall, that is what we're offering up here, just to be clear, is that we're, we're happy, this is part of what we do, it's in our DNA. Um, but you wanna make sure you have someone in your court that can do that. And you gotta give yourself enough time because right now we're already seeing it, it's getting worse, where insurance is shifting, okay? And as we said earlier, the, ride, the, 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 the height requirement to ride the ride might be getting a little taller than it was last year, and you don't wanna be in a hurry up offense. You wanna be doing this strategically, you wanna be doing it uh, mindfully, and you wanna understand also what it is that you're investing into um, and why. Um, Reed, if I could say on that, in yeah. 2020 and 2021, we would regularly get from our clients that were just starting down this path, here's this cybersecurity insurance questionnaire. Can you guys fill this out for me? It's due tomorrow. Yeah. Ugh. And we know we have to have the real answer. We're going to answer it honestly, and we're going to help you answer it honestly, but it probably means you're going to get rejected because you're doing this the day before. Give us enough time, folks, please. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're reminding me of my college classes. <laughs> here's that. Here's that project. Uh, this I, is this is not a this is not a late night cram fest, folks. You gotta gotta give us some breathing room. Yeah. No, I actually have a question that came in re, re, related to this. When responding to the questionnaire, should you include more or less context? Should you answer simply yes or no? Should you write a paragraph? If you're like Chad, should you write a book? Where? Hey now. What, <laughs> how, how should you respond to those type of things? More is better. So what we've gotten into, and this, you know, we have this conversation on both sides of the fence with with the IT professionals, uh, with security, the, the folks that are managing security, and then also the end client, right? And and the reality is that both everyone's kind of worried. Well, they're asking this, but sometimes the questions aren't a hundred percent clear, mm -hmm. right? And that's not because insurance is trying to be tricky. It's candidly, insurance is still catching up to better understand the specifics of what they need to be looking at and therefore then taking the questions that ask, you know, is this in place? And so if you're not, if you're not feeling confident that this is a black and white yes or no answer and you're like, oh, I want to provide some context here, do it. I, I say, you know, in, in the insurance world, it's, it's an addendum, but addendum can be anything. You can write it on the application. You can write it on the back. You can put it on a piece of scrap paper. You can type it up afterwards. Um, are they asking for that? No. Does it hurt anything? No, it does not. It does not. Because you don't want to be in a scenario where you are probably thinking already, well, what if what I have is not in fact what they're looking for? They being insurance. Hey, I know Great we're question. close to the end. Any other questions that have come in? Yeah, we've, we've got a few here. Um, what are the next areas that are likely to be added as minimum requirements? Oh, great question. Um, so the most recent, actually, let me cycle back through these real quick. So what has most recently been added more is the table stakes is security awareness training was kind of one of those it's nice to have but now it's getting to the point where it's kind of a must-have um so we're already seeing that's kind of one of the new ones um in in edr for endpoint detection that is something that again it was it was a nice to have a must-have for certain industry classes so they were you know insurance was identifying certain classes of business say hey you're higher risk and therefore we need to see you in a better security posture and it's now becoming more of, generally speaking, we want to see this now across the board. Um, we haven't gotten so far, but uh, SIM right now, as far as having that information um, and actually having dedicated SOC. So um, we're getting closer to that. We're seeing carriers start asking more questions there. Um, Wes, anything that's coming to mind is you've been, you've been kind of, we've been slowly but surely exposing Wes more and more to the application world and the end client you know, world. Um, the thing that's, that's, that's that surprised you. The thing that sticks out to me is when you look at the application itself, there's a lot of questions that are in it. And one of the questions I hear from a lot of folks is, do I have to say yes to every single thing on there? No, you don't. Um, and the problem is, is that some of these questions, like the big five, the ones you see here, these are the ones that decide. But there are other questions that they're asking for data gathering purposes or trying to figure out how many is yes, how many no. And then they go back in the aftermath of breaches because insurance sees all breaches. And so they understand what's happening, how it's happening, the gaps and controls. And so they're using that to do their data nerd aligning of saying, OK, it looks like this now needs to become a requirement. 
And so yeah. the things that you see in the, in the um, agree in the application, you don't have to say yes to all of them. But I'd open a good conversation with Aldridge and say, what things here are reasonable? What can we do as a small business that are reasonable that we're not doing? Because the last thing you want to do is you heard Chad say this is, oh no, last minute now you got to do this and I didn't know. So so I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of like brand new things show up in the questionnaire. You're just going to see a lot of those that were optional before they don't tell you become required. And so you really want to talk through yeah. with Aldridge to say, how do we go through this? And really start building maturity in a lot of these areas and, and something to highlight too is like what fifth wall primarily does in our partner partnership with aldridge is we are we are communicating this information so wes just spoke to hey certain questions are more heavily weighted than others well guess what we want our partners to know that too so we want to make sure that that information which is good information to know flows downhill um and guess what it never hurts to ask Another question came in, do most policies include a breach coach? And if so, is it wise to con contact them proactively? Yes, so there is um, gonna always be, with, with most main carriers, there's gonna be a breach coach. Now that breach coach is either actually gonna be an actual TPA, who's gonna be operating more as the quarterback, um, but often you're gonna see it's gonna be legal. So you're gonna actually have a legal representative that's on, again, this is on the insurance side, you call your insurance, you say, hey, I'm, something's going on. Great, great, let me patch you through. It's gonna be the legal, because legal's gonna have a lot of questions, right? And they wanna know sooner than later, hey, is this a possible exposure of third-party information? If so, we got a lot more questions. Um, so yeah, uh, and actually, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, having a cyber policy is, is not, it's not only nice because you know you can recoup costs, right? And you can be made whole, but you also, having a good cyber policy is actually going to lay out that path for you. So you're not just sitting there going, okay, now what, so what, what's the next step? They're fully aware that time is money. And they're going to want to progress you through that process uh, as fast as possible, but you know, also um, doing proper due diligence. And, and these breach coaches, especially, they're, many, they're lawyers in most cases, and so they know cyber law. It's so much more valuable than picking up... Oh, I think we lost Wes. Did we lose Wes? I, I think what he was about to say is that it's really important to understand those, those especially applicable to state law, right? Um, and being able to be proactive sooner than later. Um, some of those fines and penalties, you'd be surprised. Sitting on the fact that you've exposed third-party information for more than 60 days, every day thereafter, you could see a ticker start to come in on the fines and penalties if you are not properly notifying those individuals that are impacted. Very good. Uh, one last question, if there's others that are out there, we'll be sure to answer you back directly, but it seems like a good one to end on. How, how do you determine if an insurance company is reputable um, when you're looking for a cyber policy? Can you, I'm sorry, can you, so Wes lost power. That's, he just said uh, a storm, a storm uh, was coming through and that was the last communication we saw, I got from him. Uh, sorry, do you mind repeating that? Yep, no worries. So how do we determine if an insurance comp company is reputable when looking for a cyber policy? Great question. So, uh, and again, it comes down to your advisor. So you want to make sure you're talking to the right folks that understand. And uh, there's different ways that insurance companies are uh, benchmarked in terms of their financial rating, whether they're admitted, right, um, at state levels or if they're not admitted in the ENS market. Um, most that are out there in the standalone, so they're providing a full-fledged product, um, you're gonna, it's, you're not gonna see many that are not reputable, um, but it's more so, are they actually mature? Do they have a defined process? Is their claims process mature? It's not necessarily a question, are, are they gonna pay the claim? Like if it's written in the contract, they're following that contract. Uh, it's more on, is this a, a company that's been doing this long enough? They have a good mm -hmm. reputation on handling claims and therefore whenever I'm at my most critical, my most vulnerable, I know they're gonna do their job and they're gonna do it well. You know that, I mean, I'm just, I know it sounds like plugging, but if you're working with a company like us, we've been doing this for over seven years solely on cyber. We know every single market. We have good relationships. We understand kind of where the uh, the compass is headed on certain certain carriers versus those that are maybe taking a, a step back in the, in the market. Certainly, and that, that, that is case in point why we invite you, invited you to join us today. We want to make sure that people are working with someone that's reputable, that understands the industry and understands what questions to ask and how to properly advise. So sure. thank you all for attending. One last favor I do ask, we're going to send you out a follow-up survey to the webinar. We want to make sure that we're bringing 
content that is beneficial to you, um, that we're addressing the needs that you have in your business. So take five minutes, respond to that, please, so we can make sure that we're getting good feedback there. And we'll certainly invite you all again in the future. Reed, Chad, thank you. Wes, hopefully the storm's not too bad. Um, but all right. Thank you all. And talk thank to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.